By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are in Japan, Tokyo, for a really cool match between Nicholas. He is kind of the organizer of the old school scene in Tokyo. And he's playing a blue-white stasis deck, very cool. And his opponent, I don't know the name, unfortunately, but he's playing a very cool mono uh, black list. And I mean, we are playing according to the Eternal Central rules. So that means that mana burn is real. We've got four strip mines. We've got fallen empires. So that makes mono black pretty good, right? So it could be kind of a direct deck. Uh, but before we jump into the deck decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to go to the games first, maybe check out the deck decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. So if you click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in the description below, you will also find more information about the specific rule set. So in this case, Eternal Central. So if you wanna know more about that, check out the uh, description below. And in that description, there's also a link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. So if you wanna support the show financially, you can become a patron. It already starts for just $1 a month. So if you have a moment, please visit Timmy Talks, or sorry, uh, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks for more information about that. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm gonna start with the deck deck section of this video. I'm gonna start with the deck of Nicholas and his Stasis Brew. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Nicholas. So this is blue, white stasis. It is completely creatureless. So there are no Zephyr Falcons or Sarah Angels in here. That's something that you used to see in stasis builds back in the day, but I guess, I guess it's better creatureless. And there are a few cards here that I wanna highlight, but maybe first just talk about stasis. What does it do? It's an enchantment from blue, one blue and one to cast, that says players skip their untap step and at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice stasis unless you pay a blue. So in other words, when you've got this out, your opponent cannot do anything and you probably have a black vice out and your opponent's hand is full because they cannot play anything out. So as long as you just keep feeding it with the blue mana, you're gonna win because the vice is gonna hurt the opponent, right? I think that's the jest, that's how you wanna win the game. And then of course you're playing with Howling Mines because Howling Mines are going to allow you to draw extra cards. And if you have extra cards, it means you have a bigger chance of hitting an island every turn. And you need an island, of course, to continue paying for blue. What I think, by the way, is so cool about Stasis is this, that this is the first time that it kinda had that uh, uh, cumulative upkeep, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, built in onto a card, right? Because nothing untapped, you just have to have a new island every single turn. And of course you had this combo where you would go Instal Energy, Birds of Paradise, Stasis, because then you could keep untapping your bird with the Instal Energy and you keep uh, can continue to pay for Stasis. Now, of course, this is a very, you know, volatile uh, combo because you need three cards. The birds is very, you know, it's an 0-1 flyer. It's easy to kill. So it's not the best, but if, if you can get it to work, it is really cool. But that's obviously not going to happen here because we don't see a birds or an install energy. We do see some other interesting cards though. And one of the cards I want to talk about is removing shamans. So we see two copies of that here in the uh, main 60 of Nicholas. And I'm just going to read to you what it does under the current Oracle text. So it says, return to hand all enchantments you both own and control, all uh, auras you own attached to permanence you control, I think those are enchant creatures, and all auras you own attached to attacking creatures your opponents control, then destroy all other enchantments you control, all other auras attached to permanence you control, and all other auras attached to attacking creatures your opponents control. Okay, that was, uh, yeah, that was longer than expected. <laughs> <laughs> just a lot of text on this card. Even in the current Oracle text, it's a lot of text. But basically, you want to play this card, I guess, you know, in the in the end step of your opponent, because then you're returning the stasis to your hand and you get to untap, upkeep, draw, and then play out your stasis again, right? So it's kind of a boomerang effect. Talk about boomerang. We've got two boomerangs here in the deck as well to do the same. We also have a reset, right? Reset, two blue. Uh, untaps all your land so you know there are a few tricks here to make sure that you can continue to pay um, for your stasis and then there's a card that I think goes really well with this card which is time vault and time vault is an artifact for two that enters the battlefield tapped and doesn't untap during your untap step so it really doesn't care for stasis uh, the cool thing is here is that um, you can actually 
untap the stasis, but then you have to give uh, your opponent an extra turn. Now, now, the nice thing here is if you already know that you can no longer pay for the stasis cost of that blue island, you can say, you know what, I'm going to untap my time vault, you take an extra turn. But of course, the stasis is then still in place. So your opponent still cannot do anything, probably is going to take more damage from the vice. So you want to give your opponent an extra turn when your stasis is working, then it's your turn. You cannot pay for the stasis. So it's you cannot untap because stasis is still still on the board and during your upkeep you cannot pay the cost so you know it's kind of a foobar situation right because you cannot untap the stasis is is, is destroyed because you cannot pay the cost that means your opponent's going to untap first but wait a minute you still have that time vault so you can tap that time vault to take that extra turn meaning you're still the first person to get to untap everything again right and potentially play out a brand new stasis so i love that stasis time vault synergy right i mean it's really good um the problem of course in this matchup for nicholas is he is going to play against a very aggressive deck so the question is is he going to be fast enough isn't he dead before he can do all this crazy nonsense talking about that let's take a look at the deck of his opponent okay and now let's talk about the deck of nicholas's opponent now i don't have a name i also don't have a deck photo so i don't actually have a lot to work with what i do know is that it's mono black with a blue splash so i'm assuming he's playing that blue splash for cards like ancestral recall time walk um you know the usual time twister especially time twister being quite good in in, in this aggro kind of deck because you tend to run out of steam quite quickly um, he's probably playing Dark Rituals. I know he's playing Juzam Jins. He's, he's also got the Wreck in there. So that then I'm assuming he also has him to Turex, right? Because if you play the Wreck, you probably also play the discard game with him to Turex. And of course, Mind Twist, Demonic Tutor. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because I feel the Mono Black deck is a lot better in Eternal Central because you have access to him to Turex, but also you've got access to the Pump Knights, which are quite good. And also, of course, the Pump Knight has protection from white which could be relevant in this matchup and what i particularly like about this match is it's it's a classical battle between an aggro deck and a control combo deck right the stasis player needs time the question is is the stasis player going to get enough time from this mono black aggro player i think that the aggro player here really has a good chance of winning it especially since he's also playing you know with dark, dark rituals making his deck even faster so it's a pretty good chance that our unknown player here is uh, gonna win this match but we'll just have to wait and see talking about that let's go to the match game uh, number one here we go so on the left we have nicholas playing his blue white stasis deck and on the right we have the unknown opponent playing a mono black with a blue splash Starting here with an underground C into the rack, passing the turn. And the rack, of course, not a big problem yet. But uh, once he's going to discard, are we going to see a him here, for example? Him to Turek would be quite good. Also, because Nicholas cannot counter yet, he is tapping two demonic tutor, so no him. I'm sure if you're Nicholas, you're kind of happy now that you see a demonic, which sounds weird, I know, but you're like, okay, it's not a him. Because now he's got counter magic up with the two blue. So that is good. There's the untap. Draw for turn. There's a swamp, an artist swamp in hand, I believe, tapping three here. There's a hypnotic specter. So are we going to see a counter spell? Look at that force spike. Oh, <laughs> you got to love it. That is so good. I've been thinking about also playing with force spike in my uh, blue deck. So force spike, a card from Legends, and a uh, target spell is countered unless the opponent pays one. So it's really good in the early in the game, but of course gets much worse later in the game. There's a tap four, a Juzam Jin 5-5 five, five powerhouse. We do see a counterspell and a swords to plowshares in hand for Nicholas. So he's probably not too worried about this. But is he going to counter it away right now? Or, I mean, if he doesn't have another white, another blue. Interesting. Does he have a control magic perhaps? I don't think he plays with control magic, so didn't counter it here. I'm a little bit surprised. Perhaps he just waiting for this to happen. Like he's going to go to 15. Is he planning on playing a stasis, perhaps? Here's a Black Knight. Is he going to counter the Black Knight, then? That could be an option as well. I mean, a line of play for Nicholas could be... Okay, there's also a Bad Moon. So all the Black creatures are getting plus one, plus one. A line of player could be draw, play a stasis, then the Juzem remains tapped. Ancestral Recall here. So going to draw three extra cards. An island, a reset, and I cannot really see the card in the middle. 
But this is going to be interesting, right? What is he planning to do? He's got a stasis in hand, so probably he wants to turn that Juzum in a way to kill his opponent. Because he could have countered it away, but decided not to, so I'm sure he's got a plan with it. Are we going to see the stasis right now? He's going to tap two. Yeah, there's the stasis, and that means uh, ongoing damage here for the opponent. And now Nicholas, of course, passing the turn. Seven in hand, I believe, so uh, doesn't have to discard. And that means a damage here, so he will drop to 19. I'll, I'll try to uh, keep track of the scores, by the way, since we can't really see a dice. Also an attack here with the Black Knight, so we've got Nicholas on 13. A 19 uh, for the opponent as one untapped, uh, or of course, uh, yeah, 19 for the opponent. And now Nicholas is going to pay here for stasis, going to draw for turn. So as long as he can keep playing blue cards, he's fine. But I think you'd rather also have a Howling Mind, for example. He does have a reset as well. And uh, the opponent here doing nothing, so he's going to drop to 18. And there's another blue being paid for the stasis. Counting cards in hand, perhaps has to discard here. Also has an unsummon, but I mean, you really don't want to use your blue mana right now. So he's going to discard a Wrath of God. Passing the turn, so that means now 17 now. There's another pass. Are we going to see the reset here on end step? That would kind of make sense. Yep, there's the reset. So reset end step means he resets all his lands. All his lands become untapped again. And now he's going to take turn. So he's going to pay again for the stasis. I mean, it's a slow plan, but it's a plan, you know, using the Jews MG in here against uh, your opponent. So he's now on 16, I believe. There's a swamp. And it looks like he's just going to pass the turn. I mean, the good news here for the opponent of uh, Nicholas is he's only taking one damage. So it's not that bad. He's on 15, I believe. So he's got 15 more turns. Now he's on 14, keeping track here of his life total. Finding another land, not playing it out, so perhaps waiting for a good moment to use that third land. And Nicholas here, I believe, has to discard, having eight in hand. There he goes, discarding a counter spell, passing the turn. And his opponent is now on 13. There's another pass. So yeah, the deck doing what it wants to do, but it's not the most exciting gameplay, of course. <laughs> That's the thing with combo decks. You know, I play them sometimes, but you know, when they work, it's, it's what they do. They just do one thing. Here we see a boomerang on the stasis, and this must be pretty frustrating for the opponent. You know, you're on 12. You can't really do anything, and now you're probably going to see the stasis again, of course, hitting the board. And it looks like he's going to tap one more. Are we going to see a vice then? Yep, there's the black vice. Now it's going to go really fast because it means a damage from the Jews M3. There he goes, picking up the cards, not even waiting for it. He knows uh, he doesn't stand a chance anymore here, but now both players are going to go into the sideboards, and of course, the opponent knows, hey, this is what Nicholas wants to do. Maybe I can board in like a more, even a more aggressive uh, game, game uh, uh, post post uh, board. So anyway, um, we're gonna going to let these uh, players figure out what they want to board in and board out. Of course, I find boarding out always the hardest part. But anyway, um, and we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. And now, of course, we've got the mono black player on the play. You know, that makes a big difference. Look at this, Dark Ritual, Hypnotic Spectre. This is what you want to do. But now, I mean, if you're Nicholas, let's hope to find like an Unsummon, for example. That would be ideal for him. We know he plays with a few in his deck. Starting here with Island Mox Pearl. That Mox Pearl also gives him access to, of course, Swords to Plowshares, if he has it in hand. Going to combat. No idea what that land is, by the way. No clue. Anyway, there's these sorts to plowshares. That means two life here for the mono black player. So he's going to go to 22. I'll keep track of his life again for you. And uh, I guess, could it just be a basic swamp? Anyway, there's a him to Turek. So that means Nicholas is going to lose two lands. He is sacking it, it seems. That land. 
There's a Tundra and an Island gone for Nicholas. So only three cards left for him. Also, of course, dropped at Pearl. Oh, the land's coming back. Okay, so I, I think it's just an altar of a basic swamp. I have no idea. If you know what card it is, let me know in the comments. But for now, it seems to be a regular swamp. Look at this. Nicholas just passing the turn, missing a land drop. It's looking really good here for the, uh, for the mono black player. Does look like he's taking a damage. So perhaps it's a City of Brass then. So he's going to go down to 21. Well, 20 probably. And there's a Black Knight. 2-2 two, two first striker. There's a Black Lotus from Nicholas. Passing the turn here. There's the attack. So he's going to drop here to 18. That's first blood, I believe. There's another Black Knight. So the Mono Black player now on 19. And I mean, if, if, if you're Nicholas, maybe you're a little bit in the tank. You're thinking, do I want to counter the Black Knight? I think the best situation for him is if he can just find a Wrath of God. You know, wipe the board. But um, it's tough here for Nicholas. You know, he's, he's, he's missing a land drop again, it seems. Does have a Time Twister in hand. Do you want to Time Twist two cards for your opponent who's on Mono Black, right? Just an aggressive strategy. Do you want to give him seven new cards? Maybe you have to, you know, it's better than losing, of course. But uh, it's not ideal, that's for sure. Gonna tap two here. Okay, copy artifact. Gonna copy the Black Lotus. Gonna sack it here. Okay, play the Time Twister, then still has the Black Lotus with his new hand. Didn't have a land drop yet, so... You know, could be interesting. Yep, it is resolving. So there we go. We're going to spin the wheel. Well, actually, we're not spinning the wheel. It's not a wheel of fortune, but you know what I mean. We're going to draw a fresh seven. And I, I think if you're Nicholas, you're hoping here maybe a land for sure, but perhaps also like a time walk or something that you can be the first person to kind of untap and do something. Because, you know, if you just play a land here, pass turn back to your opponent who's on who's on the mono black strategy with with a fresh seven, it's going to be very risky. You're, maybe you're even going to see a mind twist or him to Turek. I mean, the, the mind twist will be the nightmare, of course. A mind twist fueled by, for example, a dark ritual. You don't want that to happen. So this is going to be a really crucial moment. Another line, of course, you could have if you're Nicholas to say, you know what, I'm going to drop a land, have counter magic in hand. I'm just going to counter away. Whatever, if it's too threatening, that could be another line. But look at this, by the way. No lands for Nicholas staring there a little bit in his hand again. Peak. We see Soul Ring. We see Stasis. Uh, what other cards can we identify here? Ivory Tower, I believe. He is sacking the Black Lotus. So three blue floating at the moment, I believe. Yep. Or two blue now using one for the Soul Ring. Tap the Soul Ring. Two colorless mana floating. What is he planning to do here? I'm sure he's not going to play out the stasis. That wouldn't do much for him. And of course, it's important to keep track here of the, uh, the mana floating also because this is a format with mana burn. Got to tap one. Oh, he had a time walk in hand. Didn't see that. That changes the situation. Also playing an ivory tower is not going to do much four cards in hand for Nicholas, but it means one point less mana burn. He's going to take one point of mana burn, drop to 17. His opponent, I believe, still on 19. So there's the tower. There's the City of Brass passing the turn. So at least the City of Brass allows him to counter, but I mean, it's, it's not ideal. There's still that four damage on the board from the two Black Knights. There's a Dark Ritual. I mean, probably going to allow this, right? Let's see what he's going to do with the Ritual. There's a him. So this could be a card you want to counter. Or do you want to take the risk that maybe he's not going to him the counters out of your hand? The problem, of course, is if you decide to counter to him, you don't know what's coming next and you cannot counter those cards. But yeah, I think he's going to go for the counter spell. That kind of makes sense, you know. You don't want to lose an extra card here. So countering to him, one black mana still floating. Tapping. There's an Hypnotic Spectre. Yeah, this is... This is just bad, you know. If you're the stasis player, this is not what you want to see. It's going to drop to 18 here. Oh, Unholy Strength. That is so cool to see an Unholy Strength. I love it, man. That is so cool. But it does mean six damage here. Nicholas dropping to 10. I think we're going to go to a game three here. I mean, or or if Nicholas has a Wrath of God here, that could that could change the whole situation. 
He does have the mana for it with that City of Brass and Mox Pro, so could play it out. Remember, he is on 10. You can see him thinking, is there a way out? I don't believe he has the Wrath or else he would slam it on the table. Stasis could be an option, but then you still have to deal with Hypnotic Spectre. And of course, you don't have a lot of islands here. Tapping, yeah, he is playing the Stasis. This is kind of desperation mode, right? So he's not exactly, no, 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 you cannot untap. Stasis, it's such an iconic card, but it's really a good way to lose like magic friends. <laughs> anyway, there's the attack. But this is, this is Desperation, losing a city in a bottle here. That card would have been ideal against the Juzam. I wonder if he boarded the Juzam out, considering he's playing against uh, Stasis. Maybe put some, some quicker creatures in, although Juzam is, is quite quick being a 4-4-5-5. Four, four, five, five. And now we see Nicholas dropping to 7, passing the turn, not finding an island. It's looking great here for the Mono Black player. He's really in the driver's seat. Passing the turn, Nicholas has to sacrifice the uh, stasis, cannot pay for the upkeep cost. There's an island. He's got four mana, but what can he do? Nope, that's it. Game number two, you're going to the mono black player. That means it is 1-1, one, one, uno, uno. And that means we are going to go to game number three. Game number three, the decider. Here we go. I believe both players have just taken a mulligan. Exactly, Nicholas here putting a card on the bottom. And of course, the Stasis player here being on the play after losing that second game. Look at that. Also, the Mono Black player here putting a card on the bottom. So both players starting with six. There's an island and a pass. Is that a dark ritual here? Are we going to see an explosive opening? There's a swamp. A mock sapphire. Tapping. There's a ritual he just drew. What are we going to see? No force spike. And of course, the sapphire now makes the force spike pretty bad. Right, and that's a problem with the Force Spike. Super cool card, but now you can't even use it anymore because of that one Mox. There's the pass, Hypnotic on the board. So again, if you're Nicholas, just like uh, in that first game, you have to find an answer here to the Hypnotic Spectre. There's a second blue. Oh, and you can see Nicholas there go, oh man, what to do? <laughs> that's not a good sign. This is, this is the problem with the Mono Blue. And of course, Nicholas also has that white... Uh, part of the deck, right? If he has an, uh, a Swords to Plowshares, which obviously he, he, maybe he does, but he doesn't have white anyway. So even if he does, but I don't think uh, he does. Yeah, this is a problem, right? You lose your counter magic to these Hypnotic Spectres and now you cannot counter this card. Or maybe you have two. Oh, he's pointing out like angrily at the Sapphire. It's a Sapphire's fault. It is. Because without the Sapphire, you would have countered that early Hypnotic Spectre. Yeah, this is also kind of desperation mode, this Howling Mine. And this, of course, playing also into the strategy of your mono black opponent, because he's going to draw twice as many cards. And uh, there's going to be an attack for four here. Yeah, there's really not much that Nicholas could have done different here. It is just the way these things sometimes go. That uh, top deck, of course, had Dark Ritual for the uh, opponent. That meant he could play that Hypnotic Spectre turn one, also having the Sapphire to pay for uh, for a four spike. So sometimes things just go this way and it's it's almost end, uh, end match already, you know, here in game number three. Tapping two more. There is another one. I do believe it's two black to cast, right? So you should have tapped the uh, another Swamp, if I'm not mistaken. For the Order of the Ebon Hand, it doesn't matter that much though. Let's see if Nicholas can do something. There's an Ivory Tower. Yeah, again. Not really what you want to do. If that's the best you can do, that's a really good sign for the Mono Black player. He's got six damage on the board. Can also, of course, pump those orders of the Ebonant. There's a City of Brass. Yeah, you can see Nicholas really here like, oh, man, this is, this is going so bad. Yep, Unholy Strength. I mean, I do love the Unholy Strength. I think it's super cool. But I mean, it does mean four, six, eight damage and losing a card to the Hypnotic Spectre. Yeah, this game three is gonna be over soon. I think the only thing you can hope for is to top deck Wrath of God and uh, Black Lotus. That can kind of save you here, but um, it's a big ask. Losing here the uh, Black Vice. There's a pass. An island and couldn't see the other card. Playing out the island, so I guess it wasn't the planes. 
probably also plays with balance in the deck, by the way. So a planes and a balance would work as well. So he's, he's got a couple of, you know, small, small outs. I think I wouldn't even have played this Vice here because the mono black player is already quite low on cards. And, you know, with the Hypnotic Spectre, you probably just are okay with losing the Vice. And maybe there are some cards in hand that you don't want to lose. It's hard to see what he has in hand, by the way. There's an other uh, unholy strength. Wow, that's four, that's eight. Oh, he's going to do something. Four spike. That's not going to work. That, the four spike is going to stay on it. Exactly, you pay the one for the spike. So nothing happens. But I mean, it's in your hand. Let's just play it out. Again, I think I would have kept it. Yeah, I think, I think Nicholas here is kind of already in desper desperation mode. He was on six, by the way, so he was dying lethal. So uh, yeah. That's why he did that. Makes sense. Yeah, nothing here that Nicholas could have done differently, but congratulations here to the Mono Black player. And so consistent, of course, Mono Black, which is putting the threats on the table. And like I said uh, in the introduction, Mono Black being quite strong when you have a, for, an, uh, a rule set that allows Fallen Empires because you have the Hymn to Turex. That's so good. And of course, the Pump Knights are also quite good. You know, you cannot play a Swords of Plowshares on them. So yeah, really, uh, really fun matchup here. I think whenever it goes to a game three, it's always nice. And I would like to say thank you here to Nicholas. Here you can see a picture of him playing at this tournament. He's a Frenchman living in Tokyo. And uh, thank you so much for sending me these videos. I love just to see other, you know, play groups from around the world. Also play old school Magic the Gathering is also uh, a lot of fun for me to look at. So thank you for that. And also thank you, the viewer, for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. The channel where we talk old school magic. And uh, if you're not a subscriber yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. That really helps the channel move forward. Another thing you can do to help Timmy Talks grow is leave a comment, share this on your socials, and of course, liking these videos. All these things are free and really uh, support the show. And you can also become a patron of the show via patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And that way you can also support the channel financially and help me to continue make this content for you. So if you enjoy what I do, please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And one of the perks is that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the Somebody can see.